Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Tell somebody near you, happy Volksfest weekend. Happy Volksfest weekend. Happy, happy. Happy Volksfest. Sure. I, love, I love seeing the people that I see at Volksfest at church on Sunday the next day. I figure you're either here because you need God's grace or you used up your portion of it and just need a lot more of it. So welcome back. It's nice to have everybody here today. I always wonder what the number is going to be after Volksfest. So good to be with you. And thank you to St. Luke Congregation for the week off. For those who, who don't know, I had a week off. This last week, the wonderful Sunday, maybe Reverend Larry Miller preached and presided for us. Thank you for that. Yes. Almost someday, maybe Reverend Larry Miller. Um, but thank you, church, for the time away to be free and to kind of do my own spiritual care a little bit. I appreciate that very much. Today we have the baptism of Brant Dankers. Brant is right there. He's awake right now. We'll see how long that lasts. Um, so we celebrate that as community today. I want to thank a lot of the folks who par have participated in a lot of the Volksfest community building things this past weekend. Especially anybody from St. Luke that helped with our three-on-three -three basketball tournament. We had about 24 teams this year. Um, a lot of volunteers helping out as court supervisors. We had um, Amy Tipton and the youth sell concessions. And it was just a super cool, fun time. And also thanks to anybody who didn't help out with things that didn't have the St. Luke name attached, but were still part of the community building as part of Volksfest. It's a super cool weekend, and it's nice to see so many St. Luke faces as part of all the things. So just a little bit of thank you for everybody for being part of that. That was great. Yay. Upcoming things to keep in mind, starting on this Wednesday, we have our, have our Zion worship services at 7 p.m. over at the Zion Church. Um, tomorrow, we need help moving chairs into the sanctuary. We will have chairs in the sanctuary. They're coming tomorrow at 9 a.m. Is that correct? 9 a.m. the chairs will arrive. Um, all hands on deck for that if you are able and if you have time. We are going to start by placing chairs in this section and in the far section. They're nice cushy black chairs. And we're going to leave the pews in the middle section for a little bit. And eventually we're going to switch everything out, all the pews out, with chairs. I'll remind the congregation that the building was built and designed to have chairs in it, not pews. If you've noticed the echoey reverb that still exists a bit in the sound... A lot of that, at least part of it, is because of the hard-backed pews. And the sanctuary is designed to have soft chairs that soak up some of that sound. Also, you'll notice we've never bolted the pews into the ground. They can be bolted into the ground because we have in-floor heating. And so the chairs are safer when people kind of want to stand up. You don't have to worry about pulling something down. The third reason is, is during vacation Bible school or any other time when we have outdoor activities planned, if it rains... We can move chairs around and use this space as a multi-use space. It also helps us invite other community members to use this space as a multi-use space if other people want to put indoor large events on indoors in large spaces. So it just helps us to be a lot of different things that continue Church of Hope and help in our community. If you're available tomorrow at 9, we would love your strong muscles to help us move chairs in. Sound good? Yes. Sweet. If you help, you can choose your chair. No, you can't. That's not how it works. But you can help move chairs. Okay. Uh, next announcement. Um, if you are not sick of concerts at this point, on the 23rd of June, we'll have a special polka worship, music, worship service here. The Polka Sons of Praise, widely known in western Minnesota. Like, you can't go to western Minnesota without knowing this band. <laughs> we'll be here doing a polka worship service for us. Super cool worship service to invite and bring a friend, if you're interested in that, too. Vacation Bible School, our main mission act of the summer, happens um, very soon at the end of June from the 24th to the 26th. I remember two years ago when we had a little kid pray during Vacation Bible School, and he said, that's the first time I ever prayed. And that was super cool, and that's why we do it. So invite your friends to that. Sign up soon so we know how many kids if you're planning on signing up. And we also need volunteers. Look, an email is going to go out asking for volunteers. You're going to see that email and you're going to think, man, I hope somebody signs up for this. That somebody is you, okay? This is the main mission event of the summer. This is the mission event where two years ago we had a child praying for the first time in his life, okay? So when you see that email, sign up. We need, we need um, volunteers for that. Um, after the service, there will be treats in the narthex for everybody to enjoy a little bit of fellowship. 
And those are all the announcements I have unless anybody has something I should mention for the good of the community. All right, friends, let's be together for a time of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Father, I thank you for times of Sabbath, whether they are for an hour or two on a Sunday, whether they are an extended week, but times to pull back and discover our identity again through you, not around you, not in spite of you, not instead of you, but through you. I pray that this hour that we're together can be that time through prayer, through music, through worship, through word, through any of the ways, the sights, sounds, and smells that you reach us, reach us and give us something new. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. I invite everybody to please stand. Today, friends, the Holy Spirit calls us together as the people of God. Come, Come, Holy Holy Spirit, Spirit, come. come. Confess our sins together in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Please take a moment for silence and for self-examination. Let us confess together. God of all mercy, come to our aid. When we hide brokenness and only show you wholeness, forgive us. When we cover shame and guilt with pride and pretense, forgive us. When we point out the speck in our neighbor's eye, but ignore the log in our own eye, forgive us. When we choose old, harmful ways of living over new, life-giving ways, forgive us. Transform us by the power of your Spirit, Lord God, and make us new. Children of God, God loved us even when we were dead in sin, and he makes us new through Jesus Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Live as people who are set free. Amen. Amen. Our first hymn, number 705. may all be seated. Join your hearts and let us pray together. All powerful God, in Jesus Christ, you turn death into life and defeat into victory. Increase our faith and trust in him that we may triumph over all evil in the strength of the same Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. 
Eve, we didn't talk about it, but you know. Okay. Thank you. The first reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 4. It is written, I believed, therefore I have spoken. Since we have the same spirit of faith, we also believe and therefore speak. Because we know that the one who raised the Lord Jesus from the dead will also raise us with Jesus and present us with you to himself. All this is for your benefit, so that the grace that is reaching more and more people may cause thanksgiving to overflow to the glory of God. Therefore, we do not lose heart, though outwardly we are wasting away, yet inwardly we are renewed day by day, for our light and monetary troubles are achieving for us an eternal glory that far outweighs them all. So we fix our eyes not on what is seen, but on what is unseen, since what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen is eternal. For we know that if the earthly tent we live in is destroyed, we have a building from God, an eternal house in heaven, not built by human hands. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Please all stand for a gospel acclamation. Our gospel lesson today on this third Sunday after Pentecost comes to us from the third chapter of the book of Mark. Then Jesus entered a house and again a crowd gathered so that he and his disciples were not even able to eat. When his family heard about this, they went to take charge of him for they said, he is out of his mind. And the teachers of the law who came down from Jerusalem said, he is possessed by Beelzebul. By the prince of demons, he is driving out demons. So Jesus called them over and began to speak to them in parables. How can Satan drive out Satan? If a kingdom is divided against itself, that kingdom cannot stand. If a house is divided against itself, that house cannot stand. And if Satan opposes himself and is divided, he cannot stand. His end has come. In fact, no one can enter a strong man's house without first tying him up. Then he can plunder the strong man's house. Truly, I tell you, people can be forgiven all their sins and every slander they utter, but whoever blasphemes against the Holy Spirit will never be forgiven. They are guilty of an eternal sin. He said this because they were saying he has an impure spirit. Then Jesus' mother and brothers arrived. Standing outside, they sent someone in to call to him. A crowd was sitting around him, and they told him, Your mother and brothers are outside looking for you. Who are my mother and brothers? Jesus asked. Then he looked at those seated in a circle around him and said, Here are my mothers and brothers. Whoever does God's will is my brother and sister and mother. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. May all be seated and I'll welcome up our kids. Come on up, kids. It's been a week and I missed you. (laughs) Yay! Yay! Do you want to come? Cool. But St. Luke, you can do you. I'm going to do me. How are you guys? See, this is what has always interested me in Goodhue. Boys sit with boys and girls sit with girls. All the way until you're all like 18. Baffling, but fine. It's fine. It's cultural. It's cool. Um, I'm going to ask you some questions. First of all, did you miss me? Raise your hand if you missed me. (laughs) Ouch. Thank you, Lydia. Thank you, Millers. I missed you. Thank you. 
Um, I thought about you guys. I tried to watch you on the live stream when I was gone, but the internet cut out, and it was like just in the air internet, so I couldn't see it. But you've grown so much. I have some questions for you, okay? Would you please tell me some of the rules your parents give you at home? Think of rules mom and dad give you at home. They can be rules you like. They can be rules you don't like. Bedtime, okay? What time is bedtime in your house? You have to be in bed by you do or your parents do? You and your siblings have to be in bed at 830, okay? Bedtime is rules. All right, there's one. Anybody else? Rules you have to follow in your house? Yes. You what? Number four. Number four? What's that? It's ugly? <laughs> it's a snuggly? You got a snuggly at home? And it's called number four? That's a cool name. Do you have any rules around your snuggly? Are you allowed to take your snuggly outside? Um, no. Are you allowed to feed chocolate milk all over your snuggly? Yeah. Okay, so there's some, some rules around the, around the snuggly. Okay. Anybody else? I once, I once fed my Snuggly r raw eggs for breakfast because I didn't know how to cook them. My folks loved that. That was awesome. Anybody else? What about over here? Rules you guys have at home. Huh? The dishes. What's the rule for the dishes? Yeah, yeah, right. If you don't cook, you, you got to clean up. You got to wash them every meal. That's awesome. Dishwasher breaking is great. Anybody else have rules in, uh, that you have at home? Okay, hey, raise your hand if you like your rules. So rules are meant to protect relationships, to protect you. You have to go to bed at a decent time so you can wake up and be your good, strong self in the morning, right? Your mom and dad don't want you to ruin your snuggly and never have it again, so you have rules that protect the, the value and the, the condition of your snuggly. Your mom and dad might not want you to grow up to be an entitled weirdo, so they have rules about helping out around the house, okay? Rules protect relationship. What we find out today in the gospel reading, though, is that sometimes, sometimes rules can get in the way of a relationship. Did you know Jesus' family was mad at him in the gospel reading? Did you see that? They wanted him to stop talking and doing what he was doing. Jesus' friends in this town that he grew up close by were mad at him. They wanted him to stop talking doing what he was doing. Can I tell you some rules Jesus had been breaking? Okay? Who wants to be a volunteer? Uh, how about you? Volunteer. Okay. Back in chapter 1 of the verse of Mark, there was a sick person. Here's my sick person. And it was against Jewish rules to touch sick people because they thought, well, if you touch sick people and you touch other people, everybody else is going to get sick. So that was a rule they had in place. But Jesus touched the sick person and healed him. And people got mad about that. Okay, you can go have a seat. Jesus is breaking some rules. And also there was, in Jesus' town, can I use you as a volunteer? Okay, you can look at them. You don't have to look at them. There was a man with a withered hand. Go like this. He had a withered hand. The hand was withered on the Sabbath day, a day you're not supposed to heal anybody. But Jesus saw a withered hand, and he healed the man anyway on a Saturday, the holy day, when you're not supposed to heal anybody. Okay, you can go sit down. And so there were these rules that Jesus broke through to give God's grace to people who needed it. One thing we have to be careful with all the rules is that the rules protect relationships. They don't set up barriers or walls in relationship with other people, and especially between God when God wants to give away his grace. So Jesus had to teach people the rules are there to protect relationship, not to put barriers in front of relationship, and he showed what it looks like when God even breaks rules to give grace to people who don't normally have it. He did that by healing the sick man. He did that by healing the man on the Sabbath. He did it another time by eating with someone who is a sinner and who nobody else liked in his community. And he showed that God's grace goes through rules to get to us, okay? Now everybody come up here and stand around the baptismal font. We're going to remember something together because little Brant is getting baptized today. It's a good day to remember baptisms. Come on up, everybody together. I want you guys to remember that there was a day when God promised to love you and give you his grace no matter what rules, rules you break, that he will always go through those rules to find you. He will draw you to confession. He will draw you to repentance. He will give you forgiveness. He will not, never let a breaking of a rule get in the way of his relationship with you. The day God promised that to you was on your baptism. So take a little bit of water, 
whoops, let's put water in there. Take a little bit of water. Put a little water, water in your finger. Hold your finger up like this. And I want you to put the sign of the cross on somebody's head next to you and say, God breaks rules for you. God breaks rules for you. Who's going to do me? Nice. All right, should we pray? Let's pray right here by the baptismal fund. Here, repeat after me. Dear God, thank you for rules that protect relationships. Thank you for never letting rules be a wall from you to us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, guys. You guys can head back to your seats. It's nice to see you again. Kind of nice to see all you, too, you know. Um, I want to start today. I thought I was going to have time to put this on the big screen, but I didn't this morning. I have to share a sign. If you've ever been to my office You've seen this sign, this, this sign sits over my desk, right above my computer. It was given to me in 2015. I'll share that story. It says, everything that I did in my life that was worthwhile, I caught hell for. I love this sign. I'm going to repeat it again. Everything I did in my life that was worthwhile, I caught hell for. It's a quote from Chief Justice Earl Warren, who was the Chief Justice of the U.S. Supreme Court back in the 60s. I was given that sign by a mentor of mine in 2015 as a little piece of encouragement. 2015 was a rough year in my church leadership life. This was at my previous church back in in Washington. Around that time, I had been battling with church leadership. Battling might not be the right word, but it's the word I'll use today. In, In heavy conversation with church leadership about what it would mean to have kids stay in worship during the worship during our worship sessions. What we used to do back at my previous church is is at the beginning of the service we'd have a children's sermon at the beginning of the service. And then after the children's sermon we'd invite the kids to go out to Sunday school which is in a completely different building. So the children were removed from the worshiping community for worship to have their own Sunday school hour as a as a a faith formation what would you say? A person who has studied deeply on how faith, for me, faith is formed in young people. I, I've known for years that the best way to incubate faith in young people, this is a very good conversation to have on Baptism Sunday, is, is to keep families together during worship and faith formation experiences. Kids need to see mom and dad praying, singing, worshiping, doing all those things, the movements of faith so it gets into their DNA as they grow up. Separating children from the family for faith formation is one of the worst things you can do for a child's faith development. Hence the strong conversation I was having with the church about maybe changing that aspect of our life together. For years I, I tried to change that and that's when my mentor gave me the sign to just keep encouraging me, encouraging me everything I did in my life that was worthwhile I caught hell for. It actually reminds me of one of my favorite Lutheran, Lutheran jokes. How many Lutherans does it take to change a light bulb? Have you heard this one? Change? <laughs> so it wasn't just about kids in worship, right? It was about changing something that had been in place for a really, really long time. It was a challenge. It, it was just a reminder that, that people love a good status quo. We get comfortable around the status quo. And anytime there's purported or suggested change, there's going to be a little bit of pushback. Jesus' experience with people in Capernaum, in, in Capernaum in our reading for today was like that. He was receiving, obviously, a fair amount of pushback for a lot of the changes he was doing in his culture with his society, even from his family who wanted to also remove him from the situation. As I mentioned to the kids, it's hard to know why everybody is upset at Jesus without a, out a lot of context behind the third chapter of Mark. We have to go back to see what Jesus had been doing to make people so upset. As I mentioned to the kids in the first chapter of Mark, Jesus healed that man with with leprosy, a man who had leprosy, a man that Levitical Old Testament holiness code said, you can't be around, you can't touch. Jesus touched him when he healed him. 
this was against Jewish laws, Jewish rules, Jewish norms. The boundaries of God's grace did not move to people with leprosy, but Jesus did. And so people were upset with Jesus. That was like strike one. Jesus is going to have three strikes. Later in the second chapter of Mark, Jesus in, receives an invitation to eat dinner at Matthew's house, and Matthew is a tax collector. Tax collectors in the Jewish world at this time were considered Roman financial agents. They were helping to, to, to help Rome stay in power rather than the Jewish people stay in power. It was against Jewish cultural norms to eat with tax collectors who were, who were sinners. Jesus accepted the invitation anyway. That was strike two against Jesus, and people were extra mad at him. You can think of the first three chapters of Mark as like a slowly boiling pot. Where in chapter 1, the heat gets turned up a little bit on Jesus. In chapter 2, it's like the little bubbles start forming and it's turned up a little bit. And in chapter 3, things start boiling over. At the beginning of chapter 3 of Mark, Jesus heals a man on the Sabbath, which we modeled in our children's sermon as well. God's grace not only had cultural boundaries like, like don't heal lepers, don't eat, eat with tax collectors. God's grace had time boundaries too. You could heal on any other day other than Saturday. Saturday is a holy day. Saturday is a Sabbath. You don't break that day for God's grace. Jesus did it and people started getting really, really mad. It made me wonder this week, like, what the, what the Jewish equivalent, there has to be something. The Jewish equivalent to everything I did in my life that was worthwhile I caught hell for is like what was running through Jesus's mind I use that phrase to catch hell I don't I hope you don't think that's rude I use that phrase too for a specific reason this is what made me think of it Jesus is literally accused in in chapter 3 of Mark of bringing hell by crossing all these boundaries of grace bringing God's grace to people who normally didn't have it he's accused of being an agent of Satan for this which it's somewhat ridiculous. If you read this as modern-day Christians, we might look back on this and say, well, that's odd that humans would act that way, that anybody crossing boundaries, bringing God's grace to, to, to disenfranchised or, or underprivileged populations, people who are left out of the social stratus of an environment, that's, how would we ever call this hellish? We've done that for centuries. It seems to be humankind's reaction. Oftentimes, human beings try to extend grace to communities or people that haven't had it before. Doing a little bit of research this week, I was, re I was reminded that Martin Luther King Jr. himself was called an agent of Satan, a son of Satan, for wanting to extend civil rights to the African American community in the 60s. Like, we've seen this movie a number of times before. Mahatma Gandhi was assassinated by wanting to protect, protect rights in India of the Dalit, the untouchable people from the racist caste system that, that India had during his time. I'm reminded regularly in the news that even more, a more modern example, the Taliban of Afghanistan these days, anytime women gain a modicum and extension of, of human rights, anything in Afghanistan, the Taliban pushes back against that. If there is a person or a group out there trying to extend grace beyond boundaries previously set, beyond rules previously established, somebody is going to push back and say that's not the work of the Spirit, that's the work of Satan. Humanity is pretty consistent. God pushes grace beyond boundaries we expect. Humans ask God to pull back and stop. It's interesting that Christ's own family wanted to seize him and make him stop. But this is also the story of the gospel. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, given to us to push grace past our own boundaries. All of us here today, we name at the beginning of the worship service, are sinners in need of repentance. That's what we say when we confess. And by the end of the service, we've been promised Christ's blood. We've been promised Christ's body. As Christ pushing past all those boundaries for us. This is the heart of the gospel. What's ironic and what's important to, to notice today too then is, is also how Jesus identifies this pushback, what he names it as. Did you notice the only sin, look through the Bible, the only sin Jesus names as unforgivable? Unforgivable is a strong word by the way. Did your mind stick on that when you heard it in the reading? This is an unforgivable sin. It's the only time Jesus names a sin as unforgivable. Is right here, Mark chapter, chapter 3. The only times he names a sin as unforgivable, unforgivable is this pushback against the Holy Spirit's movement to extend God's grace past boundaries that have been set up culturally over time. 
out of all the sins in scriptures and think about, think about your favorite sins, your own maybe personal greatest hits, all the things you've ever done that you've gone on your knees in the dark of night to say, I'm sorry, help me to change this. Out of all of these things, push back against the Holy Spirit's movement to break boundaries of grace in society is the only thing that Jesus identifies in scripture as unforgivable. Think of adultery, idolatry, murder, theft, exploitation, whatever the greatest hits of sin you might have in your head, in your head. It's this naming of extending God's grace through boundaries already set up that Christ says, that's the bad one. That's the one that's hard to come back from. That one is unforgivable. You can lie, you can kill, you can steal, you can do countless of things that, that draw guilt from your, from your soul. But if Jesus says, if we, excuse me, but if we say something like, God can't forgive that person because they did that, or God can't forgive that person because they are like that, or God can't forgive that group of people, or God won't seek to make relationships with that group of people because they did that, or they are something like that. That's the one that invites us to question God's grace for us. It's almost like if, if we're going to be the ones to name a boundary or set up a boundary for God's grace, we have to put ourselves in that boundary too. If we're going to limit God's grace to somebody else, we have to deal with a God who limits his grace to us. And at the end, it's, it's sort of easy to see why. When we do that, we forget of who Jesus is to us and who Jesus is to our world. We were sinners. When we came to the waters of baptism, the waters that we're going to baptize Brand here today, we were sinners in need of God's grace to wash us clean. When we come to worship in repentance and confession every Sunday before we go to the table, we name the fact that we are sinners in need of God's grace to move past our boundaries of selfishness and fear and anxiety and the pain and the hurt we cause to others to move past all of us and change something in us and make us new. And we would receive that gift and honor that gift and take that gift in ourselves and then dare to tell somebody else that that grace isn't for you and dare to tell a different community that God's grace might go all the way to death and beyond for me, but it stops somewhere for you. To that, Jesus says, if we're going to limit God's grace, that limit bounces back upon us. If we want to live under a limited definition of grace, we have to have that limited definition of God's grace. It's no wonder that it's a sin against the Holy Spirit to say that God can't go there to you or to them or to that person outside there or that community over there to invite that marginalized person into relationship with God. That's what Jesus came to do, to break the grand boundaries of God's grace, starting in Mark chapter 1, going all the way to the cross where death is the final boundary and he moves through that for us too. Our job as Christians, instead of defining limits, of God's grace, setting up limits for God's grace. Our job is to participate with Jesus as he breaks down those barriers and limits too. To walk with him as he goes to that leper that that group shouldn't touch and heal and touch that leper so they too understand they're part of the community of God. To go with Jesus as he eats at that sinner's house and invites that sinner to be a follower so that sinner understands that they too are part of the wider community of God. We don't stop it. We don't seize Jesus. We don't ask him, don't do what you do. Let's stop Mark at chapter 3. Let's not move all the way to death and resurrection in Mark 16. We say, Jesus, where are you going next? To what house? To what community? To what broken body? And how can we continue to participate with you as you extend the realm of God's grace into our world? That's our job. Friends, the message I want you to take away today God's grace has no boundaries. You experience that in your own baptisms at either this or another baptismal font. Let us participate with Christ as he extends the boundaries of God's grace to people that we don't know, to communities we are not yet a, yet a part of. But if we follow Jesus, we will be part of that extension. As we do that, I bet we see any sort of thought 
that Christ has limitations of his grace that can get into us. We'll see that melt away. And we'll see Christ's grace getting even further and deeper into us. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, as we baptize um, little baby Brant today, help us to think back to all, all our own baptisms where our whole life was placed before you as you brought us to the font. All the good we have done, all the evil we have done, all the amazing altruistic thoughts that run through our heads and all the horrible ones we hope never see the light of day. And in that moment, you claimed us as your children, promising us to, promising us to wash us, to make us new, to never leave us as you found us, help us to be part of your ongoing work in spreading your grace past boundaries. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right, I will invite the congregation to, to remain seated for our hymn of the day. We will now worship God through our offering, and I'll invite our ushers to come receive the offering plates. Join your hearts, friends, and let us pray a prayer of thanksgiving for God who gives us gifts that we now get to lay upon God's table. Let us pray together. God of all creation, all you have made is good, and your love endures forever. 
He brings forth bread from the earth and fruit from the vine. Nourish us with these gifts that we might be for the world signs of your gracious presence. In Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Uh, Brant, will you please come up here with aid from your folks? And brand sponsors can also come up as well. I'll have you guys stand here-ish. And sponsors stand about here. Oh, you guys will need red books. Um, congregation, please open to page 227. I'll give you one for each crew, how about? Well, I have more. You look like a guy who wants his own. Do you want your own? Okay. How about? 227. 227. I'll give you a moment to get that. Page numbers are lower left. Yep. Okay. Hymn numbers are upper right. It's an honor to be with you all here today doing this. Let us begin. Friends, in baptism, our gracious Heavenly Father frees us from sin and death by joining us to the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. We are all born children of a fallen humanity, but by water and the Holy Spirit, we are reborn children of God and made members of the church, the body of Christ. Living with Christ and in communion with the saints, we grow in faith, love, and obedience to the will of God. Parents, called by the Holy Spirit and trusting in the grace and love of God, you desire to have Brant baptized into Christ. If so, please respond with, we do. Excellent. As you bring Brant to receive the gift of baptism, you're entrusted with the following responsibilities. To live with him among God's faithful people. To bring him to the word of God and the Holy Supper. To teach him the Lord's Prayer, the Creed, and the Ten Commandments. To place in his hands the Holy Scriptures. To nurture him in faith and prayer so that he may learn to trust God. Proclaim Christ through word and deed. Care for others in the world God has made and work for justice and peace. Do you promise to help Brant grow in the Christian faith and life? If so, please respond with, we do. Excellent. Sponsors, do you promise to nurture Brant in the Christian faith as you are empowered by God's Spirit and to help him live in the covenant of baptism and in communion with the church? If so, please respond with, we do. We do. Awesome. Church, people of God. Do we promise to support Brant and pray for him in his new life in Christ? If so, please respond with, we do. We do. Definitely do. I invite everybody to please stand. We profess our faith together. I ask you to profess your faith in Christ Jesus, reject sin, and confess the faith of the church. Do you renounce the devil and all the, defo all the forces that defy God? I renounce them. them. Do you renounce the powers of this world that rebel against God? I, I renounce them. them. Do you renounce the ways of sin that draw you from God? I, I renounce them. Do you believe in God the Father? I, I believe, believe in God, God the Father, Father Almighty, Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. earth. Do you believe in Jesus Christ, the Son of God? I believe, I believe in, in Jesus Christ, Christ God's, God's only Son, Son our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, Spirit born of the Virgin, Virgin Mary, Mary suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He descended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. Do you believe in God, the Holy Spirit? I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. We give you thanks, O God, for in the beginning your spirit moved over the waters, and by your word you created the world, calling forth life in which you took delight. Through the waters of the flood you delivered Noah and his family. Through the sea you led your people Israel from slavery into freedom. At the river your son was baptized by John and anointed with the Holy Spirit. By the baptism of Jesus' death and resurrection, you set us free from the power of sin and death and raise us up to live in you. Today, pour out your Holy Spirit, the power of your living word, that those who are washed in these waters of baptism may be given new life. To you be given honor and praise through Jesus Christ, our Lord, and the unity of the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Amen. 
Will you hold this for me for a moment? May I have a little Brent? Hello. Brent. Ooh, hi. <laughs> Bright eyes. Yep. Brent Dankers, I bat you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Good job, little guy. All right, you're a left arm, aren't you? Yep. And here is this for his head. Good job. Thank you. Well, let's see. There we go. Friends, let us pray. <clears throat> we give you thanks, O oh God, that through water and the Holy Spirit, you give your daughters and sons new birth. You cleanse us from sin and raise us to eternal life. Today, sustain Brand with the gift of your Holy Spirit, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord, the spirit of joy in your presence, both now and forever. Amen. Amen. Brandt, your new name is child of God. You have been sealed by the Holy Spirit and marked with the cross of Christ forever. Amen. Who is my bravest sponsor? You look pretty brave. Okay, your job, you will light this candle and you will say the words I show you. All your sponsor's jobs is to put this day in your phones that this is about his baptismal birthday. And then whenever you, when he's old enough to receive calls or while his parents are old enough to receive calls for him, call him or if you're around him and say, hey, this is the day you were born a child of God, okay? Until you die or he dies. That's your job. Just put it in your phones. It'll be there forever. Go ahead and light that. You can light this every baptismal birthday he has to remind him of his new name as well. Speak those words to him. Brant, let your light so shine before others that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Thank you. Perfect. Friends, together as a community, let us welcome Brant into the body of Christ. We welcome you into the body of Christ and into the mission we share. Join us in giving thanks and praise to God and bearing God's creative and redeeming word to all the world. Amen. Thank you. You all may be seated. You can blow that out. I will take the baby. Scary words. Thank you, Brant. Um, and make sure you all take, take, take these home. So that little first piece of the sermon about wrapping kids in the Christian story at home, you have a quilt that it was knit by members of our church to remind him the prayers of our church are always with him. You have a beginner's Bible to read with him a little bit of scripture at night. And you have these faith in the home items also offered by our Christian care team as well. Different ways to bring your faith into the home with him as we grow in partnership with you in raising little brand in faith. This is our newest member. Who knows? Could be, could be the future president of St. Luke Lutheran Church right here. Treat him nice. The power he wields someday could be legion. <laughs> I got us straight. We got St. Luke always has kids running around. That's, that's what we love. The adults want to do it, but they're too socially <laughs> conscious. Hey, buddy. Do you want to come with me? We can go together. It's all right. It's all good. My kids quit following me around years ago. This is fun. Say hi, Brant. Hi, Brant. Oops, that's a leg. There's a hand. This is fun on these more chill Sundays. We can take more time. Everybody say hi, Brant. Okay. So when you see Brant, like, in the sea store impatiently waiting to buy his Snickers, remember, he's a child of God. When you see Brant riding too fast down the road on his bike and doing a lot of Jay riding or Jay walking, remember, he's a child of God. He's an extrovert, I think. All right, I'll invite the congregation to stand as we continue with our prayers. We come before the triune God to pray for our communities, ourselves, and our world. 
You awaken our hearts to your mercy. We give you thanks for renewers of the church in every age. Enliven the creativity and persistence of all seeking to transform the church into a closer vision of your beloved community, merciful God. Your presence is revealed in the shade of trees, the growth of seeds into flowers, and in the blessing of plants granting food in their right season. Heal land scarred by deforestation, pollution, or infestation. Teach us to cultivate the earth with respect and reverence. Merci merciful God, receive our prayer. Our nations and communities are divided, O oh God. Teach us again to listen with curiosity and mercy, even in disagreement. Grant us the humility to acknowledge our hardness of heart, our hardness of heart, and make us bold in modeling cooperation for the sake of the common good. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Hear the prayers of all who cry out to you from the depths of fear, despair, or hopelessness especially Keith, Judy, Jan, Dave, Sean, Mark, Julie, Harlan, Beth, Gage, Elaine, Alex, Maria, Perry, Marlo, Linda, and Kay. With haste, rescue victims of trafficking, exploitation, and abuse, and bless organizations and individuals who work on their behalf. Merciful God, Receive our prayer. Grant wisdom and clarity to all who are in seasons of discernment and transition. High school graduates preparing for first jobs or new educational journeys. Those who are shifting careers. And those who are navigating changes in their relationships. Accompany them with your peace. Merciful God. Receive our prayer. Praise to you for our ancestors in faith who believed, spoke, and lived in you. Give us confidence that as Jesus was raised, so we too will be raised with all the saints into your everlasting presence. Merciful God, receive our prayer. Receive our prayers, O God, and come quickly to our aid through the power of the Spirit and the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Thank you. May the peace of Christ be with you always. And also with you. Share a greeting of peace with somebody near you. I'll tell you what that cryptic conversation was all about. <laughs> so Pastor Hasselquist is right there. Will you raise your hand, Pastor Hasselquist? Who, yeah, some, many of you know him better than I do. Go ahead. <laughs> if, if I've gotten my St. Luke history right that I learned literally 45 minutes ago, Pastor Hasselquist was the transition St. Luke being its own individual identity rather than yoked with another church it was either Zimbrod or Red Wing. I may, I may or may not have that totally right, but for anybody who might not know why he's important, that's one of, one of the many reasons. Um, anyway, thank you for being with us here today, and take some time after the service if you remember Pastor Hasselquist to thank him for one thing he said to me as he came in was, I've heard St. Luke was doing pretty good, and I wanted to see it, so... <laughs> He's here. Okay. I will invite everybody, let's gather hearts and minds together for a celebration of God's crossing boundaries for us at his holy table. Friends, the Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is, it is right. right to give him thanks and praise. Remember again together today that on the night in which Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, he gave thanks and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. 
After supper, Christ took the cup. Having given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, saying, This is the new promise in my blood, which is shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Do this for the remembrance of me. Together with one voice, we pray the words Christ taught to us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May we all be seated. I'll welcome our council members up to come, please. Help serve. The holy table is open for all people. If you would like a blessing in the place of communion, just let one of the servers know by holding your hands in the sign of the cross that invites blessing, or like this down here that invites blessing as well. Come on up. Don't be shy. We'll have you guys come in the choir, and then the right side, and I will start with the left side.
invite everybody to please stand. In thanksgiving of God's gifts for us, his life, his blood, his body, we pray together a prayer of thanks. Let us pray together. God of abundance, with this bread of life and cup of salvation, you have united us with Christ, making us one with all your people. Now send us forth in the power of your spirit that we may proclaim your redeeming love to the world and continue forever in the risen life of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. On this day, friends, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face look upon you. Excuse me. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Final hymn together on our way rejoicing. Friends, today go in peace to love the Lord and serve your neighbor. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God.